Hey guys, how's it going? This is Wolfpat and welcome to part 3 of my chess basic series, where I will teach you everything you need to know in order to start playing chess right away. If you haven't seen either of the previous parts, make sure you do that since you'll need that information to understand what we'll cover today. For today's video, we'll be looking into tactics, the condiments of the chess world, endgame checkmating techniques with different pieces, and chess openings for white and for black. Let's get started. Chess is 99% tactics, or so would Master Richard Teichmann have us believe. The truth is that chess is a combination of many things at once, but there is no denying that tactics are by far the most interesting, beautiful, and powerful moves in the game. So what are they? Tactics are moves in the game that severely limit your opponent's moves and, when the smoke clears, result in an advantage for yourself. They can often be unintuitive or seem like they lose material but will actually gain an advantage after the combination is finished. There are many types of tactics. The important thing to remember is that the better placed your pieces are, the higher the chances of a tactic to your favor being possible. Also, after playing for some time and analyzing your games afterwards, you'll start to develop a sixth sense about tactics and will get a feeling for them when they appear on the board. Like international master Danny Wrench would say, you'll smell the blood. Let's take a look at some of the most common tactics in chess. The first tactic is the fork. This is considered the bread and butter of chess tactics. A fork is defined as a simultaneous attack of two or more enemy pieces with a single one of your own pieces. Every piece in the game can do this tactic. Here's a few examples for each piece. Over here, the white pawn is attacking both the rook and the knight at the same time. Black cannot say both in one turn. And here, the knight is attacking the queen and the rook at the same time. And although the black queen can move and defend the rook, the knight is valued at 3 points and thus black would still be losing the exchange. On this one, the bishop swoops in the middle of the diagonal to attack both rooks at the same time. Much like the previous example, one of the rooks can move and defend the other, but it's still losing material after the white bishop captures. This example shows the queen being the boss that she is, attacking absolutely everything at once. And on this last example, we see even the regal old man being able to perform a fork. As he moves to e4, he attacks both knights at the same time, and due to their positions, they cannot move and defend each other. Naturally, the king can only perform successful forks on certain pieces and on certain situations. The next tactic we're going to talk about is the clearance sacrifice. We've already touched upon sacrifices on the last video. We usually do them in order to gain some sort of positional compensation or an attack on the enemy king. The purpose of a clearance sacrifice, however, is to give up one of your own pieces that is in the way with a forceful move in order to clear the way for your other pieces. Like most tactics, it seems to just lose the piece immediately with no compensation, but will allow the player who actually did it to gain more than she or he has lost. For example, here, white has a battery on the h7 square with the queen and the bishop. Unfortunately, the white rook is blocking both pieces from directly attacking the square. And, what's worse, black is attacking the white bishop with a knight. If white simply retreats the rook to a safe square, black can take the bishop and the attack on h7 evaporates. Instead, white plays the rook to the 7th rank, attacking the black queen and offering the rook. If black takes the rook, or moves the queen, its mate on h7. So, although at first it looks like white is offering a rook for free, it actually incurs a heavy price if taken. This next tactic is called the decoy slash deflection. This is a really cool one. As the name suggests, this tactic involves either forcing a piece to a specific square, that is called a decoy, or forcing it out of a specific square, which is called a deflection. Either way, the concept is the same. By forcing a piece to a spot where it is more vulnerable, you can give up material immediately but eventually gain it back with interest in the next few moves. Here's an example. Black has the upper hand, with his or her queen still on the board in exchange for a knight and a rook. However, white has a devastating decoy tactic up the sleeve and will win the game. Rook to f8 check. The king has no other choice but to capture the rook, since he has no squares to run to, but after doing so, the knight jumps to d7, forking the king and the queen. 
White will easily win the endgame with the extra piece. For the next tactic, we have the Desperado. This one is the love child of a sacrifice and an in-between move, but a Desperado is only considered so in specific situations. This tactic comes about when a side has more than one piece on pre and on defended. If that side cannot save both pieces with one turn and will lose material no matter what, they can perform a Desperado, which basically means taking as much material as they can with one of the pieces and forcing the opponent to stop the rampaging piece first. Eventually, though they will still lose material, they can pull an Andros and say, if I go down, I'm taking you with me. For example, here both the Rook and the Knight are being forked by the Bishop, and neither piece can move and defend the other. So, instead of just meekly taking the hit, White can capture the pawn with check and only then retreat the Rook. Even though he or she will still lose the Knight in the process, they will be taking a pawn for the troubles. The fifth tactic is called the Discovered Attack slash Discovered Check. These are both the same type of move, except obviously the Discovered Check involves attacking the King directly, instead of any other piece. This tactic comes about when one of your own pieces is blocking an attack by another piece on an enemy piece or the enemy King. This allows you to move the blocking piece and attack something or retreat while simultaneously creating a threat of your own. As you might have guessed, discovered checks can be incredibly devastating and should almost always be avoided by the defending side. The next tactic is the double check. This one is very similar to the previous tactic, so it involves a piece moving out of the way from another piece and discovering an attack in the process. However, when both the piece that is being moved and the piece that is being blocked attack the king at the same time, it is considered a double check. A double check is THE most forcing move in the game, period. Since there is no way for the defending side to block both checks at once or capture both check and pieces at once, the defending king must always move during a double check. Well, if it can't, it's just simply checkmate. This tactic is usually the most devastating one in the entire game because of how much it limits the opponent's potential replies. It also allows for the moving piece to safely occupy squares that would normally be defended. Here's an example. This is my favorite checkmate in the game, and it utilizes a double check. After the queen delivers check on this diagonal, the black king has two choices. If he goes to the f-file, we can just play queen f7 checkmate. So, instead, the king goes to the h8 square. Now, the knight jumps to f7 with check. The king has no other choice but to go back to g8. The knight then moves again, but this time to h6 with a double check, one by the queen and one by the knight. Since it's a double check, the king has to move and the knight cannot be captured. At this point, the knight could come back to f7 and just keep checking the king for a draw, but white has something so much better. The queen comes all the way down to g8 with check. Since the king has no squares available and cannot capture the queen by himself since it's being defended by the knight, the rook must do so. But once the rook captures the queen, the knight can jump to f7 for a final time, but this time with checkmate. This is checkmate because the king cannot move anywhere since his own pieces are blocking the way. That is why this checkmate is called a smothered mate. For our next tactic, we have the Interference. Similar to a clearing sacrifice, but opposite. This tactic involves moving one of your own pieces so that it blocks an enemy piece from influencing a specific square or set of squares. This does not always involve a sacrifice, but often does. Here, for example, we see that white would have a checkmate in 1 on g7, but alas, the queen is defending that square. So. White can move his knight to e5 and block the way. This interferes with the queen's defense on g7. If black captures the knight with a pawn, then his or her own pawn will prevent the queen from directly defending the g7 square. Otherwise, the black queen has to give herself up for the knight so they can try to delay checkmate for a few more moves. The next tactic is called overloading. This is basically a typical Monday for a piece. 
When one piece is trying to do too many things at once, it's being overloaded, since you can only make one move per turn. For example here, the queen is trying to defend both the knight and the bishop, and is overloaded with work. White can capture the knight first, forcing the queen to abandon the defense of the bishop, and then capturing the bishop for free. This next tactic is called removing the defender. As the name implies, it means capturing a piece that is defending another piece. Most effective if the initial capture is a forcing move. For example, the knight is defending the bishop that is under attack, but white can capture the knight first with check and then take the bishop after black recaptures. Tactic number 10 is called the skewer. This happens when a long range piece is attacking a higher valued piece through an even higher valued piece, forcing the first piece to move and then capturing the one behind it. For example, here the bishop attacks the queen directly and indirectly attacks the rook behind her. The queen must move away from the attack and only then the bishop captures the rook. The next tactic is the pin. Yes, we're going back to pins for a second. We covered what they were on the previous video but it's important to understand that a pin piece is usually close to useless, since it cannot or shouldn't move. This allows one side to keep attacking the pin piece over and over until the defending side runs out of ways to defend said piece. A pin also allows friendly pieces to occupy squares that were previously defended by the pin piece, but since it's pinned, it can no longer defend them. For our final tactic, we have the windmill. This is a pretty looking tactic that is based upon the discovered check tactic in combination with a followed up check. A windmill comes about when a piece can move or capture an enemy piece, producing a discovered check by another one of your friendly pieces, and then come back to the initial square to check the opponent's king again, allowing for the same discovered check on the next move. Sounds a bit confusing, but this is basically how it works. Here. White's bishop can move into the diagonal and check the black king. The king can only move to h8, and blocking the check with another piece would only give up material for no reason. After the black king moves, the white knight hops into f7 and delivers a check to the black king, forcing it to move back to g8 and directly in the firing line of the bishop. The knight can then capture the rook and unleash a discovered check on the black king, forcing it to move again to h8. Then, the knight repeats the process by going back to f7 for check, forcing the king here and then moving again with discovered check. As you can see, the black side is trapped in this loop of checks until the white side decides to end the suffering. This tactic can also be used to force a draw by repetition in case the side performing it is likely to lose. This information will help you recognize and utilize tactical opportunities to your advantage. However, the only real way to get good at spotting them is to play long games and keep looking. Eventually, you'll just develop the sixth sense for them. The next thing we must cover is the endgame checkmating techniques with different pieces. We covered when a side has sufficient material on the previous video. Now, we're going to look at how to actually checkmate the opponent in those situations. But before we do that, we have to talk about one more term that is pretty much the basis for any endgame play that involves the king. That is, the opposition. When both sides start using their king as an attacking piece during the endgame, it is important to remember that unlike the rest of the pieces, the kings cannot move into a square that is being attacked by the enemy, including the enemy king. Knowing this, and knowing the squares that your king controls at any specific moment in time, we should look to restrict the opponent's king movement as much as we can by gaining the opposition. In short, gaining the opposition means placing your king directly in front of your opponent's king where only one square separates the two. This prevents the opponent's king from being able to move forwards because your king controls the three squares that separate it from the opponent's king. Having or losing the opposition in an endgame can be the difference between losing and drawing, or drawing and winning. So, whatever else you take away from this video, make sure the opposition is one of it. So now that we know how to gain the opposition, let's start with the king and the rook. 
The checkmating technique for this one is very curious. You're looking to force the opponent to gain the opposition and then deliver a side check with a rook. Since the opponent's king cannot move forward and cannot stay in the same rank or file, it is forced to move back. You keep repeating this process until you get the opponent's king to the edge of the board and then deliver one final check while the opponent has the opposition. This time, since there is no place to retreat to, it is checkmate. This is how it looks on the board. If your opponent retreats voluntarily, simply move the rook closer to the king one square and cut the king off, like this. If the king moves and attacks your rook, simply swing the rook to the other side of the board. And if you find yourself always taking the opposition, just make a waiting move with the rook by moving it on the same rank or file until you force your opponent's king to take the opposition, like so. The next scenario is the king and the queen. For all intents and purposes, you can just use the same technique you use for the king and rook, but you have to watch out for stalemates. However, I'm going to show you a much faster way since the queen is much more powerful than the rook. Using the queen and king as a tandem, you can severely limit your opponent's king mobility. In just a few moves, you can bring the opponent's king to the edge of the board and then force checkmate as you see fit. The danger during this particular endgame scenario is, of course, stalemate. It is very easy to mess up and cut off all of your opponent's king available squares without actually putting him in check. These are some of the most common ones. You'd do well to memorize what they look like, maybe even give them a silly name to remember. For example, here we have the Triangle of Dangit, and here we have the Ale of Lame Sauce. Now, for the king and two bishops of opposite colors. This one is a bit more tricky. The idea here is to use both your bishops to create a kind of wall that the opponent's king cannot pass through. We can do this by moving our bishops side by side next to our king and forcing the opponent king's back. Then maneuvering our king to the side and further forcing the opponent's king to the corner. Do note that the corner is by far the easiest place where we can force checkmate with this piece configuration. Also important to note is that stalemate is a very real possibility and we must make use of waiting moves whenever necessary. Here's what the checkmate looks like. First, we bring our bishops together and use our king to support them. Then, we slowly start closing up the enemy king until it has just these two squares available. After that, we can take our time to move the king to the side that is closest to the corner of the board. Once our king is on the perfect position to block the king from escaping the corner, we start forcing the opponent's king towards that corner by attacking the squares that lead away, like so. Once the king is in the corner, we have to be very careful to make a waiting move in order to reposition our pieces with check and avoid stalemate. After that, it's just about giving the finishing blow. Last, we'll look into the king, knight, and bishop. This one is infamous for its precision and difficulty. There's even top level players and masters who have drawn a game with this piece configuration. The key here is to very precisely coordinate all three pieces into creating a cage for your opponent's king. You have to realize what kind of colored bishop you have and place your knight on the same type of color so that it controls the other type of color, like so. You can only deliver checkmate on the color corner square that is the same color as your bishop. The king is the glue that keeps it all together. If you find yourself on the defending side of this scenario, your best chance is to try and stay in the middle of the board. If you find yourself being forced back, try to make a run for the corner of the board that is the opposite color of the bishop that your opponent has. So, if your opponent has a dark square bishop, go to either light square corners, and vice versa. If you're trying to win this endgame, the first step is to centralize your pieces, coordinating your bishop and knight so they attack opposite colored squares. Then. You must use your king to force the opponent's king further and further to the edge of the board, bringing your knight and bishop even closer. Once your opponent's king is on the edge of the board, he or she will try to stay on the corner that is the opposite color from your bishop. Since the bishop cannot attack that square, it is up to the knight to flush the opponent's king out. 
Once we reach this position, which is very common, there is a series of specific moves you pretty much have to memorize in order to force checkmate. Of course, it's still important to understand why you're moving while you're moving. First, we must make a waiting move with the bishop to force the king away from this square. Then, we must move the bishop again to prevent the king from trying to go back to the corner. After that, you move the knight here. If the king tries to go back, we deliver a check. The opponent's king moves to attack the knight, but we move our king and defend the knight. The opponent's king must move closer to its demise. We move the king again one more time, and when the king tries to escape again, our bishop swoops in with a check and locks the cage again. We repeat this process until we get the king to the corner and eventually deliver checkmate on the corner. Just watch out for stalemates. Well, let's say in this position the king doesn't go back but instead tries to make a run for it. It might look like it's going to break free, but all we need to do is move the king first instead of the knight, then move the knight to the exact same square we would have anyway, and just like before, the bishop will swoop in and close the cage before the king can escape. After that, we just reposition the bishop to further restrict the opponent's king and force him back towards the edge of the board. Only this time, he'll be closer to the corner we want him to be in. Now, we just turn to the same pattern of moving the knight, then the king, then the bishop, until we deliver checkmate on the corner. That's pretty much the gist of it. Obviously, if there are more pieces on the board, the strategy will change. But as long as you remember how the pieces coordinate with each other and with the king, you should be good to go. Finally, let's go over some very basic openings for white and black, along with the ideas behind each one. Generally speaking, the most popular ways to open the game for white are either e4 or d4. In other words, the king spun opening or the queen spun opening. From here, the game can continue in a huge variety of ways, but certain moves are preferred more than others and are almost always played. Let's take a look at e4 first, dubbed Best by Test by the famous American champion Bobby Fischer. This move, which is my personal preference when playing white, usually offers a more tactical and dynamic game. Chess is sometimes like tennis, in the sense that the way the game is played is dictated by both players. After white plays e4, Black can choose to steer the game one way or the other by playing a certain move, to which White will then try to adapt and steer the game towards his advantage on the next move, and so on until the middle game. In this case, let's assume Black plays e5, which makes sense. Trying to place a pawn in the center, opening up the queen and the bishop, controlling d4 and f4, etc. Sticking to some of the chess opening principles I mentioned in the last video, White now plays knight to f3. This move develops the knight to its best square and throws a punch at black by attacking the e5 pawn. Seeing this, black follows up with knight to c6, developing the queenside knight to its best square too and at the same time defending the pawn on e5. From here, white plays bishop to c4, developing the bishop to an aggressive diagonal, targeting the weak f7 pawn and also vacating the way for the king to be able to castle. At this point, we can safely say that white is going for the Gioco Piano opening, which is Italian for slow game. This is one of the easiest openings to play for white, and generally leads to a slower, more tame kind of game. The next opening we'll take a look at for white starts very similar to the Gioco Piano, but a small tweak in the bishop's development leads to a completely different type of game. It starts again with e4, e5, knight to f3, and knight to c6. This time, however, the bishop goes to b5 instead of c4. The idea here is to exchange the bishop for the knight that is defending the e5 pawn so that white can then gobble it up. Black sees this and can choose to defend the pawn with d6 for example, or be aggressive and attack white's e4 pawn with something like knight to f6. Whatever the case, once white plays the move bishop to b5, the game is now considered to be a Roy Lopez game or Spanish opening game. Now let's take a look at an opening that involves playing 1 d4 instead of 1 e4. d4 openings are considered to lead to more positional games where each side will try to squeeze an advantage in the middle game in order to win. 
Obviously, that isn't to say that there won't be any spicy tactics possible in certain variations. When white plays 1, d4, black can follow the same idea as we saw on the first example of the king's pawn opening and play d5, mimicking white. From here on, the best idea for white is to play c4. Looks kinda weird, right? I mean, it just seems to give up a pawn for free. But after d5 takes on c4, white can now play e4, since the pawn that was in d4 is no longer controlling the e4 square. With the same move, white now unleashes the bishop on the black c4 pawn. Black is not advised to try and defend that pawn further, and instead should look to start developing the pieces. If black is greedy and tries to defend the pawn by playing b5, we can just strike with a4, trying to deflect the b5 pawn from the defense of the c4 pawn. If black takes, then look at the terrible pawn structure. Two sets of isolated double pawns and simultaneous attacks on a4 with the rook and c4 with the bishop. I would gladly give up a pawn if I was white here. So what happens if black doesn't budge? Then they have two choices. If they play a5, then it's no good, since after a takes on b5, the black pawn on a6 is pinned to the rook. If black takes back, then they just lose the rook. So what about c6? Then, white can take on b5 and after the recapture, just develop the knight to c3, hitting the b5 pawn with tempo. From here, white will have all the initiative and keep black defending over and over, forcing black's pieces to get in each other's way, all at the cost of one pawn. Let's get back to 1d4 for a moment. From here, black can pretty much play any other move it wants, but one of the purposes of white's first move is to control the e5 square. And if black doesn't try to do the same, then on the next move, white can play e5 and have what is called an ideal pawn center. If that's the case, the burden of proof will be on black to show why they think allowing white to get both pawns on the center is not that great. Now let's take a look at some openings for the black side. If white starts the game with e4, black can choose to play a move like c5 instead of e5. The idea here is to control the d4 square with a side pawn and thus preventing white from establishing two pawns in the center. This opening is called the Sicilian defense and is arguably one of the best defenses black can cook up against 1 e4. This opening gives black a lot of aggressive play on both the king side and the queen side depending on the variation. From here white can develop the knight to f3 and black can either play d6, e6, g6, knight to c6, etc. I will not go into the very complex beast that is the Sicilian defense in this video, but it will suffice to say that if you are an aggressive player who just can't bring yourself to play for a draw, the Sicilian defense is for you. If white happens to go for 1d4 however, I personally like to play knight to f6 right away. This keeps my central pawns flexible in case I want to transpose into some other opening a few moves later. In most cases, after black plays knight to f6, white will follow up with the plan of playing c4 and then knight to c3. After c4, black plays g6, showing the intention to place the bishop on the powerful long diagonal via g7. Another option is to play e6, so that after white plays knight to c3, we can develop our bishop to b4 and pin white's knight to the king. This would denote the Nimzo Indian defense. However, if we do go forward with g6 on move 2, once white plays knight to c3, we can lash out with d5. This denotes the Grunfeld defense, which will allow the black pieces to use the d4 pawn as the focus point for all the rapid development. And if white isn't careful, they could be in a world of hurt. This is only a small taste of all the openings that are out there. Unless you're planning to become a super grandmaster in chess, you'll hardly need to learn all the popular openings. So just do a little bit of research, watch some good players play some openings, and choose two or three from each side to focus on, that you really like and they go with the way you play. I will be releasing videos of my favorite chess openings in the future as well as doing chess live streams so that you can watch me play them for real and hopefully learn something. That concludes our three-part series of chess basics. If you stuck with me this far, 
you should have all the tools and knowledge you need to get out there and play some chess. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them on the comment section down below and I will do my best to answer them. These videos took several dozen hours to make, so if you enjoyed them and feel like you've learned, consider subscribing to my channel so you don't miss out on future content. Giving me a thumbs up would also help a ton. And if you really want to go above and beyond to support me, my Patreon will be on the description. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you on the next video.